All right, brace yourself, my friends. I'm going to spit straight facts. Shining a light on autism and life as an autistic person. Welcome to My Friend Autism, a podcast breaking down barriers, stigma and misconceptions around autism while increasing understanding and acceptance of the autistic community. And now, here's your neurodivergent host, Orion Kelly. Well, my friend, welcome back. Oh, welcome. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. I'm all about helping you raise your level of understanding, acceptance and appreciation of the autistic community. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, all you've got to do is join us. Join this amazing YouTube community, this amazing autistic podcast YouTube community. How do you do that? Well, it's very easy. I've got a primary YouTube channel, Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. Join the community there. I've also got this purpose-built, dedicated video podcast YouTube channel, Orion Kelly Podcasts. And of course, you can listen to my podcasts if you want to do that, wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for doing that. If you are listening to my podcast, one of your favorite podcast platforms, thank you. Amazing. And if you're watching it on the YouTube channel, again, thank you. Amazing. Either way, you're supporting the autistic community, which is what we're all about, my friends. So let's get going on this very interesting topic. We're talking about RSD, rejection sensitive dysphoria. Hmm. Okay. And what is RSD's connection to autism? Now, RSD can kind of feel like, I don't know, the devil within, the, the enemy within. And why? Well, we're going to get to that. I guess we better put some groundwork down. <laughs> Let's start off by talking about what is rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Okay, cool. I've got it here. (laughs) RSD is a condition that can make it difficult to handle rejection or, this is important, perceived rejection and is characterised by an intense emotional response to perceived rejection or criticism. So... People with, that, people with RSD often experience feelings of shame, embarrassment, and worthlessness in response to even minor setbacks or negative feedback. Mm. I can feel that. I can feel that. And what happens then? Well, that can lead to social withdrawal, anxiety, depression, and I guess and a whole host of other mental health challenges. Now, RSD, rejection, sensitive dysphoria, is commonly associated with conditions including ADHD and autism. Important to note too that it isn't actually an officially recognised medical condition, but it is recognised as a real phenomenon, okay? Something that does actually affect people, including autistic people. Okay, so we've we've laid the groundwork. Hope that makes sense. RSD, in effect, is basically this difficulty you have handling rejection, right? Or dealing with perceived rejection. So you might not even actually be receiving rejection, but you perceive it as that. That's why it can kind of be like that enemy within. Someone says something, you perceive it as a rejection or a criticism. Very common for autistic people. You might say just really sensitive yep but it goes further than that for an autistic person and obviously that reaction that intense emotional response is you may perceive you're under threat you're being attacked or criticized rejected whatever manifests in many different ways for autistic people all right so it's believed autistic people are more likely to experience rsd than other peers, other neurotypical peers. Why? Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's complicated. I guess it could be in part due to our challenges as autistic people with social interaction, communication. That obviously makes it harder to navigate social situations, right? Mm. What else? Well, we have difficulty understanding and interpreting social cues. That can leave us more vulnerable because if we can't really 
understand or interpret social cues and communication, they're potentially more vulnerable to perceive that as rejection or criticism or something negative. And obviously that can have a significant impact on the life of an autistic person, on the daily life of an autistic person. If you are vulnerable to feeling like communication coming to you is rejection, perceived rejection, criticism, those types of things, well, it's probably going to stop you from doing a lot of things. Like why would you bother with social activities? Right? Why would you bother trying to make or keep friends? Why would you bother putting yourself through the hassle and stress of those kind of interactions and socialising? What about going to work or school? That's hard, right? If all you feel is this perceived sense of rejection or criticism, or you're obviously highly sensitive to actual rejection or criticism, which we all get, we all get this intense emotional reaction to actual rejection and criticism, let alone perceiving it as that. That's going to make life really hard because not only is that hard for you, but then if you are, if it's manifesting into this intense emotional reaction or outburst in school, in work, in friendships, it's going to be detrimental, I guess, for everyone, right? So it's a really hard thing to carry. It's a big burden to carry. All right. Now, I want to provide some examples. All right. Let's talk through some examples. But then I also think it's important to go through some strategies. Not that I think strategies are, are, are always helpful. A lot of strategies for autistic people aren't helpful. They just don't work. But I, I'll do my best to try and find some that you might be able to put into place. But first, all right, let's do some, let's do some examples. Okay, so how does an autistic person, a neurodivergent person, experience RSD, rejection-sensitive dysphoria? Let's start off with the fear of being rejected because I reckon this is a pretty interesting one. Okay, so a fear of being rejected by your peers, by your friends, by your family, by your co-workers, your schoolmates, which leads to anxiety, which leads to avoiding social situations or workplace or school interactions because of that anxiety. That's an example. Another example is a sensitivity to criticism. So an example of how an autistic person experiences RSD is through a sensitivity to criticism, which leads to emotional reactions. They can often be disproportionate to the situation. You may actually feel extreme, intense guilt and shame and sadness that isn't proportionate to what has just happened in the eyes of other people, potentially neurotypical people. Difficulty accepting feedback or constructive criticism. Another example of how autistic people can experience RSD. This leads to defensiveness, withdrawal, emotional outbursts. Now, as an autistic person, and I've got an autistic son as well, difficulty accepting feedback or constructive criticism is massive to me. I don't. There's a a difficulty. It's an impossibility. Like... I don't know why. And this is the paradox of autistic people. My whole life revolves around an inability to stop my brain from finding faults and errors. I'm constantly picking up mistakes and errors and faults. So good at that. Yet, if someone does that to me, I can't handle it. It's, it, it's I don't know. It's something that's just overwhelmingly like, whoa, I'm not, this is not good. <laughs> It's hard to give you much more insight than that, than the paradox. And it can be very frustrating. I get it. Imagine being the person. Like, it's not like I want to live my whole life having a brain that's constantly picking up errors and mistakes. I don't want that. You can't shut it off. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to get to that one. But I reckon if you know an autistic person and you're autistic, I reckon it's probably pretty safe to say, there's a good chance that you're not so good <laughs> taking the feedback or the, what people call constructive criticism. I love that too, by the way. Criticism is criticism. There's no such thing. So it's constructive, but it's still criticism. All right, well, so it's not a compliment then, yeah? So, like, it's still criticism. There's, not, there's nothing constructive about it. Oh, no, but it's constructive. What do you mean? Oh, I mean, uh, I'm telling you, you know, you'll be able to fix it all. It'll help you. 
Well, it might help you, mate. It doesn't help me. What, what if I can't get anything constructive out of it? What if it is just criticism to me? It's, it's only constructive because you want to say it regardless, so you're putting a word in front of it to make it easy to say. It might be constructive to you. It, it doesn't, it's bloody unhelpful to me. Here's something constructive. Keep it to yourself, champ. All right, another example of how autistic people may experience rejection-sensitive dysphoria. A sensitivity to perceived or actual rejection. And this is a big one. This is from everyone. Everyone. So we're sensitive to not only rejection, but even something we maybe misinterpret or perceive as rejection from everyone, our friends, our family, our romantic partners. What happens? Well, we basically just feel worthless. It leads to despair and sadness and worthlessness. Because not only are we getting rejection, actual or perceived, from people that are relatively important in our life, but we're sensitive to it in a disproportionate way. Right, through RSD. So that sensitivity makes it way worse than it needs to be or that the neurotypical person or other person wanted it to be. So some people, it's just it's a thing. It's like, well, it's rejection is just rejection. It's a yes, it's a no, whatever. You know, but for autistic people, it's very different. So let me, okay, a few practical examples. All right. So to me, if it's coming from like let's say it's coming from my wife or you know uh, someone close to you, a reject, an actual rejection. To me, in my mind, that would be the sensitivity. There would be a complete, absolute cold shutdown to any more kind of interactions or feedback or anything. In addition to that, whatever the rejection was based around, I would virtually give that like a blanket lifetime no meaning. Like a rejection once, to me, the sensitivity is like, well, that's that. Done. It's not, can't, that's that. It's over, that particular thing. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, and the sensitivity too, the kids can be the same. They can take that rejection from people close to them or even, even perceive rejection at a sensitive level. You think this is ridiculous. And they might, honestly and truly, they might, not even want to do things they want to do anymore. They might shut down completely or stop. or the, the, Because, you know, our brains are just struggling to understand it at the, at the sensitivity level that's coming across. It makes it really hard. It's a tricky thing, yeah. I, I think it's like you just turn off, you shut off, you close down, right, a, as a result of that. that. That's how sensitive it makes us feel. Yeah. Another example, uh, fear of making mistakes or underperforming. So how would, how would this manifest? Okay, so this idea of an autistic person experiencing rejection-sensitive dysphoria through a fear of making mistakes, underperforming. This would work at school, yeah? Academic world, work, social settings. Really every setting, you could make a mistake. You could underperform. That leads to... Anxiety and obviously procrastination, putting these types of things off. Why would I bother doing this if I'm just going to stuff it up or just be overall crap at it? And this fear of making mistakes or underperforming, I think, flows through all facets of an autistic person. Because really, you kind of grow up being different and therefore you're always making mistakes because you're different. If you're different, what you do is just natural to you. But if it's wrong to to neurotypical people, to people who aren't different, then that's a mistake, right? See, you're, you're already born basically being told you're wrong. So nothing you do you feel is ever right. So therefore you have this super sensitive fear of making mistakes because that's all you're told you do. And then because of that, you always feel like you're bad at everything. So this, it's impossible to not underperform. So like, why would I bother? I'm either going to stuff it up or it's just going to be crap. And it's, it's, it's really horrible. So, and everyone, everyone experiences these feelings. I'm talking about it at the level of RSD. And that's why for an autistic person experiencing this, that kind of level can be overpowering. It can be debilitating. 
What does that lead to? Another example. Avoidance of activities or situations that may trigger rejection. So, you know, for some people, it could be public speaking. They might be trying new things, going to new places, meeting new people. Is it hard to get your autistic partner or your autistic kid or kids or whatever to go to new places, to meet new people, or even just to go to places and hang out with people? To do these types of things, you, you think you might think you know, but you don't. You think it might be good for them, but it's impossible. But, but did you hear what I've just been talking about? This all adds up, right? This all adds up. If, it, if you're going to feel like this about all the things we've just talked about, of course you're going to bloody avoid them. Sit, what are you, dumb? Like, seriously, come on. Of course you're going to avoid them. Why would you not avoid the activities and situations that could trigger the rejection? that we've just talked about in all those different areas. We are going to get to strategies, don't worry. It's not all just dark clouds. Sunshine's on the way, apparently, allegedly. Another example of how autistic people can experience rejection-sensitive dysphoria is a difficulty with rejection in romantic relationships. Now, this obviously leads to an intense fear of being left or abandoned. Okay, this is a big one. I'm an autistic guy. I'm married, my wife's not autistic. At the most basic level of relationships, autistic people can find it very hard, I guess, to navigate the nonverbal stuff, the cues, the signs, the things of relationships, let alone romantic relationships, okay? So you do have an intense fear of being rejected, and that can mean anything. It can be physical stuff. It can be ideas, thoughts, anything, right? Because well, if this person rejects me, I'm stuffed. This is like my person. So, you know, this is bad. <laughs> if it's, if, so yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm singing myself now. <laughs> great, great sentence there, Ryan. Like, seriously, it's like, all right, if, if my, my wife isn't in the mood, let's say, right, for something physical or sort of it, and, and so she, she doesn't reject me, but like she rejects me by definition, but doesn't do it badly or anything. For me, it's like, oh, that's the, I'm just not going to bother anymore. I just won't. It's just like, she it doesn't, like, doesn't want to do that anymore, not attracted anymore, doesn't love me anymore. I just forget about it. Like, and that's disproportionate and that's not right, but that's how you can feel in the moment. And the abandoned thing is really important. If you're autistic, obviously you're born different. And from a very early age, you aren't accepted. Right? You aren't embraced. And it's pointed out to you regularly that you are different, that you're just not quite right, mate. You need to sort yourself out. We don't like your type around here. You're just a bit weird. Yeah? Okay. So you're being abandoned from birth. Like from birth, you're being abandoned. They, they look at you. They pick you up. Oh, you're different. They put you back down. They keep moving. They find more of people that aren't different. So the fear of abandonment is real because if your entire life is about no one accepting you or appreciating you or understanding you, then when you finally meet people who do, it's basically every day, it's basically you making them prove to you they, they do. And that's not like they don't have, they shouldn't have to, but it's like, I don't believe you, you want, you like me or want to be here. I don't believe it. It doesn't make, because, and it's, it's, it's frustrating for the other people but look at it from the point of view of an autistic person. A lifetime, a lifetime of being isolated, ostracized, pushed away. Honestly, why would you think we won't assume everyone is going to abandon us? We, we are. We're, we're, as a class of people, we're abandoned. If we're not, then, then why, is, why, is, why is the stats to say that it's actually really hard to be an autistic person in modern day Australia and many other countries, employment and mental health and quality of life, let alone just lifespan. It's hard. So it's a real issue. Man, that, that fear of uh, being left or abandoned is, is such a big thing with our safe people. And I, I think too, if, you have a, if you're a parent, you might find that, your autistic kids 
are not the easiest to drop off, whether it's at school or friends or family, you know, sport. Like they're, not, they're just – it's one more hug, one more cuddle, or they just they just can't or – you know, and again, it's, it's very much rooted in that idea of being left or abandoned. They really need the reassurance, which will never be enough, but it's – and it's frustrating. I get it. It's – but imagine being the person feeling it. I really feel for for autistic kids in that in that instance. It's horrible. A couple more examples, and then we'll get to strategies. Overthinking and replaying social interactions. This is another way autistic people experience rejection sensitive dysphoria. So what we basically do is we try to identify where things went wrong or what we could have done to avoid rejection. Or criticism, and this for an autistic person, oh, I hate this. It never stops. Conversations from ten years ago, <laughs> decades ago. Seriously, they can't. They'll pop up out of nowhere. Honestly, a conversation that didn't go well, or whatever, or you think or you perceive didn't go well, will pop up in your head after ten years for no reason, and you have to relive it. You have to, you're constantly going through it and picking it up and identifying where did it go wrong. What could I have done differently to avoid this rejection, this criticism? And you never get the answers because well, then if you did, you would, it wouldn't happen in the first place. But overthinking these social interactions and replaying them and trying to fix them, this is a massive example, a massive sign, something I can absolutely relate to of, autist, of, of autistic people experiencing RSD. And final example for some strategies, uh, another example is feeling intense shame and embarrassment over past rejection. So I reckon a lot of people don't like rejection and criticism. That's normal. I get it. What I'm saying is I think it's it's fair enough to say in general terms that neurotypical people or people who aren't neurodivergent can potentially handle rejection or can overcome rejection and criticism greater than neurodivergent people, autistic people. I don't I can't give you the reasons why, but I think it's it's a it's a give. If you don't experience RSD, you're probably going to handle uh, rejection slightly more or you're probably not going to be riddled with intense shame and embarrassment for the better part of the rest of your life right for autistic people it can lead to a fear of future rejection and avoidance of new opportunities because it's so intense the feeling the shame and embarrassment of remembering past rejections even perceived rejections it hits so deep that there's this intense fear of it happening again, and therefore an avoidance of never being in a position where it will happen again. And that's something that's really hard to navigate. But let's go through a few points and do our best to try and help us through. I, I want to be clear, though. It's really important to understand that, that RSD, rejection-sensitive dysphoria, is a normal reaction to rejection and criticism for neurodivergent people. It's part of, it's part of our experience. It's not, a, it's not a failing, it's not a personal failing, okay? It's important to remember that everyone experiences rejection and criticism at some point in their lives, and we all experience it differently. Okay? Cool. Great. <laughs> so, here are some strategies that autistic people can use right now to manage rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Well, the first thing is just recognize it, okay? Just recognize it. RSD, it's a real real phenomenon. We get that. It's a real thing. Understand it's not your fault. It's a common experience for many autistic people, many neurodivergent people. All right, you need to learn to identify the triggers that can lead to RSD episodes. So the triggers like criticism, rejection, perceived failure. You need to learn to identify those triggers. What are the triggers that you can identify, that often lead you to automatically think this is a rejection or a criticism. Another thing is you need to calm your own mind because it's, it's, your mind is experiencing the RSD, not the rest of your body. It'll, I mean, it will manifest in your body, but it's the mind. Calm your mind. How do you do that? You could practice mindfulness, meditation. Just do deep breathing if that's all you want to do. Slow, you know, like in six seconds, hold six seconds, out six seconds, deep breathing exercises. You want to help yourself stay calm. You want to train your mind to calm your mind, to center yourself during these difficult moments. Yeah? How about a support group? 
it's hard. I get it. Autistic people find it hard. Finding groups of autistic people that you click with or trust is hard. I get it. But developing a support network that could be trusted family members, friends, that could be just a mental health professional, could just be seeing a therapist, psychologist. That could be your support group. Someone who can provide you with empathy, with understanding, and if needed, advice. A support network. It can be really important. Create a self-care routine. That's also important. Now, that's because when you do things that you enjoy, again, it's going to have you in a more regulated, in a more um, calm, happy mindset. Self-care routines are really important for autistic people. They help us stay regulated. They help us stay happy and calm and peaceful in a world that's not built for us. It could be anything. Your special interest, your passion, exercise, art, get out in nature, whatever it is. Other things could be developing coping strategies that you know work for you. So for me, coping strategies could be things like, you know, some of my favorite types of TV shows or being a part of my content creation world and you're just doing something that I'm passionate about. Or, you know, just going for a walk. Yours might be journaling, writing things down. Might be having a deep conversation with someone you trust. It might just be engaging in a passion of yours. All great coping strategies. Another strategy to help you navigate rejection sensitive dysphoria as an autistic person is developing healthy boundaries. Mm. I mean, developing you, not them, you developing healthy boundaries with the people that tend to trigger your RSD. Now, a good way to start is by practicing to say no when you need to. Yeah, if you are super sensitive to criticism and rejection and failure and all these things, as an autistic person, it can be hard to say no. You kind of want to say yes to people, please, to avoid the rejection. You need to learn to say no when you actually need to and want to say no. Personal boundaries respect yourself that's what it's all about creating routines and structures also really important when you create a routine or a structure to your day obviously can help you feel in control and and obviously control reduces stress people say autistic people can be control freaks whatever it's not true It's, it's with anxiety and stress controlling the controllable is actually a great way of maintaining a calm peace rather than rising and heightening stress and anxiety. So that's really important. Engaging in some sort of regular exercise or physical activity, I always say this because I really want people to get this. It helps you reduce anxiety and it promotes overall well-being in your autistic brain. And you hear the word exercise, regular exercise, physical activity, you think, oh, no, I can't do that. It's anything, guys. It's just, like It's just... Getting your body moving, getting the blood flowing, it, it, will, it helps your brain. It helps you. Anything will do. Setting realistic goals for yourself and celebrating your victories, your small victories along the way is another great way of navigating rejection-sensitive dysphoria. So you, 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 what, you feel like you always make mistakes or you underperform? Have a look at your goals. Like you have to be realistic with yourself. You have, to be, you have to be realistic. You set realistic goals. And, you know, when you do achieve things, big or small, you need to celebrate them. You, you do actually need to stop and celebrate these types of victories. It's really so important. You could use grounding techniques as well to navigate RSD. So I've talked about deep breathing. It could be just focusing on stuff, focusing on your senses. Things that ground you and bring you back to you in the present, right? That kind of mindfulness stuff. They can help you reduce anxiety. Another way you can help navigate rejection-sensitive dysphoria is through simply reframing the situation. So you're focusing solely on rejection or criticism, right? That's what you're doing. That's what we do. We have this sensitivity to perceived rejection, criticism, or actual rejection, criticism. So we're focusing on it. Someone's talking to me. They're probably rejecting me, criticizing me. It's probably negative. They're probably attacking me, right? Well, hey, let's, let's for a second here, let's shift the focus. 
It can either be, let's try to focus on the positive aspects of what they're telling me. Maybe it is criticism, but what are the positive parts of the criticism? Or it doesn't have to be positive. Maybe it can just be, I'm going to focus on this conversation and I'm not going to allow myself to label it as rejection or criticism until I've heard it. And then I'm going to still think about it and give myself time to process it. So processing is important for autistic people. You don't grow out of this. Your need for processing in different periods of time for different situations will take longer than you think. And you have to give an autistic person time to process. Give them that space. Allow the silence. There is no awkward silence in processing. Only for you, probably, the neurotypical person wanting the answer. So just understand that as an autistic person. Time to process the conversation. Don't judge it. Let's get to the bottom of this, okay? And then let's look for the stuff that's helpful. Think about the skills. Think about the experience you've gained from the process. From the process you may be being criticized about. There's some sort of rejection or failure attached to. Is it really that bad or are they actually actually are trying to help you? Because most people that tell you this kind of stuff, their heart's in the right place, for the most part. So there has to be stuff you can gain. How can this help you in the future? Right? Because let's say it is actual rejection or criticism, and that's going to happen because you have to. That, you're a human. That has to happen. You're not immune. You have to get it. You're not, no one has to say yes to you all the time or you're not perfect. Okay, great. How can this help me as an autistic person live my best possible life going forward in the future? What could I learn from this? How can this help me? I know it's hard. You go in, bang, all guns blazing. You're attacking me. It's rejection. It's criticism. Blah, blah, blah. Attack back. Blah, and no one achieves anything. So you stop. Don't judge it. Process it. Get to the bottom of it if you need to. Talk to the person. Ask them follow-up questions. And then work out, what can I learn from this? How can this help me in the future to be a better, a better autistic person of a better quality of life? I think that's probably a really important one. And it's hard in practice, but you've got to give it a try. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And the starting point is just try not to perceive everything as an attack, as a rejection, as a criticism, which as an autistic person is super hard because of a legitimate phenomenon, an intense sensitivity, an intense reaction emotionally to any type of rejection. And that, my friends, is rejection-sensitive dysphoria. My Friend Autism with Orion Kelly. Join the conversation now by following Orion Kelly on Facebook. Well, as always, I appreciate you for being a part of my mission to help autistic people get the understanding, acceptance and appreciation that we all deserve. So thank you so much for your support. I appreciate it. Uh, check out the YouTube channels if you haven't already. Don't forget, I've, uh, I've got a book out. You might want to check it out on my website. More importantly, hey, what do you want me to talk about? Put it in the comments below. If you have topic suggestions for an upcoming video podcast, put it in the comments below. Or if you're listening to my podcast, just go to my website and contact me. You can email me through my website. What do you want me to talk about? Honestly and truly, what do you want me to talk about? Let's, let's hear it, okay? I really do appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Until my next video podcast, thanks for listening and watching. And we'll talk soon. You've been listening to My Friend Autism with Orion Kelly. To join the conversation, get in touch with Orion and binge all the podcasts, blogs and videos, visit orionkelly.com.au.